So for today's lecture we have Petro. He came all the way from Athens to talk to us and to visit us and to visit our activities. So <laughs> That's it? <laughs> You're gonna say the other thing about the no, it's just about Okay. Um, Thank you for coming. Especially after the meeting you had with the security guy. I think you're all tired now. Uh, I'm going to speak about my work and some things that are very interesting to me and that helps me do more work. So I'm doing photography and sometimes I'm doing video, but uh, I'm doing this kind of photography which doesn't require skills of being somebody like a paparazzi running from my subject. There, are, I make this. I distinguish photographic styles. Like, there are some photographers that they go outside in the world and they photograph what they see. And I tried to do that, but it wasn't me. I got bored really fast, and. Because it's not my mentality, I'm more into myself thinking and programming and uh, making things more important than what they are. And I'm more into making stories and lying and make people believe these lies. I start directing my pictures. But to do that, I wanted to go back to my past my glorious past because I'm Greek I was brought up to believe that I am a kid of uh, Alexander the Great who conquered the world with a horse and he's the greatest of everything and Greeks did it and you know all this bullshit and this, this happened but it happened 2000 years ago so I look back to my past a hundred years ago not 2000 years ago and the memories that I had from my village and from my family were far from what we were taught in the school. A friend of mine uh, started talking to me about Albert Kahn, a, a rich guy who sent uh, photographers all around the world to photograph it as it was. I think it was in the early 1910, 1920s, the very first color images of the world and he found some images of uh, my area in Greece uh, North Greece Macedonia and at that time it was a bit mixed it was more about the Balkans and less about Greece so the images were like that I noticed there was nothing posh nothing glorious nothing to be so patriotic and proud, but at the same time, I could identify this landscape to the stories from my grandmother and to some images that I found in my house. So this was more close to my mentality than the Parthenon or the golden statues or whatever. And I realized that my area was a mixture of cultures and civilizations. There were like uh, Jews, Muslims, uh, Bulgarians, all kinds of races. And there was no purity, no golden race. So I went back to my village and determined to do my vision of what is photography and not going around people trying to persuade them to photograph them because I didn't have this talent to be very communicative and to be very fast. I took my big camera and I thought that this would be a, a weapon to help me persuade them. It would make me look important and people would trust me. At the same time, using a big camera, it changes the way you photograph. Everything becomes slow and everything becomes important. Also because you don't use a lot of film, you don't have many chances to do things right. So it's better if you don't fuck it up. You have one photograph, make it happen. I didn't have the money to buy a good digital camera at that point. And I said, okay, I'm gonna make it. With all this 
messed up thoughts in my mind and the photograph of my grandmother in front of, my, of a dirty background with some garbage around. I tried to, to copy the technique of the traveler photographer in the early 20s, 30s, 40s. So I set up a plastic background in the courtyard. This is my house in my village. And I start with my father. I asked him to, to play a role. I told him, listen, this is not you, but you will do it for me. And he laughed and he, uh, he started again saying, why did you become a photographer and you didn't become something else? But he did it. So I said, let's, let's make you uh, uh, somebody who gets married. So we use some elements of that tradition, putting money as a show off that we have money and put him to a shoot. And then because he was selling apples in the market, I said, bring me the worst apples you can get. So I started creating this character over the top and trying to put my elements, trying to get away of the reality. And I found that it worked. And going back to my sketchbooks and to my drawings and to whatever I wanted to do, I said, okay, now I'm gonna make a soldier because all my background is about wars and uh, heroes and I had to go to the army. I had to spend one year <coughs> being useless and being a soldier. I know, I know how to do it, I will do it. So I created a character. It's like a teenager dressed up as a soldier Again, using the same technique, the same background. And I said, I'm gonna pick somebody to make the scientist and be something completely random. And then I tried to find weird characters and I, I felt very free to do whatever I wanted. And then I, I had to find a girl, which was impossible in the village because there are no girls. And I went to another village. I took it to my car and we bought a cake and I said, this is the script, that's what you have to do. And she was disappointed because she wanted to look pretty and she wanted to look nice. And I told her, no, no, you have to look very neutral, very sad because you live in this shitty village and <laughs> the story. Uh, and then I found a, a young neighbor and he was like, uh, okay, don't, don't try to persuade me, I'm gonna do it. Just do it fast. So I told him, the story about uh, me wanting to become an astronaut, like all the boys, and he told me, I don't wanna know, just do it. So I started wrapping him around, and the other ki kids came around me, and they start laughing, and it wasn't very pleasant, but in the end, they were happy to be behind the camera and observing <laughs> this. And this was like a, a worker that we had, and he was from Albania, he would do anything for five euros. He would, he would do anything. And he said, I'm gonna do this for free for you. And I told him that I needed somebody really, really hard, really, somebody who would do anything, just like you. And he said, I know how to do it. And we did it. <coughs> Going back and again and again, uh, I realized that, okay, with my studio and my portraits and with my characters, I wanted to get rid of the people and I wanted to focus on the set. I wanted my narrative to be different. I wanted to make an impossible story, but to do it in that way that people would believe it, that they would follow the story and they would be really intrigued and drawn to my reality. As I said, my background is full of uh, fights and wars and I had this idea of uh, being part of in a Balkan war, in a, in a muddy war. And I tried to make a cannon, a ready-made cannon, uh, my cannon. So I, I did this. I had in my mind the idea of Greece, not the one with the blue skies and the happy people but something which comes 
closer to my reality in the way I had it in my mind. So you see the colors are not so vibrant. It's, it's not a stereotype, it's not a cliche. I'm using uh, banal uh, objects, but at the same time, I'm trying to do something different. And each time, I would follow a specific procedure. I had all the research that I had done before. I tried to be somebody, let's say a filmmaker. And with that camera, I was imagining myself that I would make big images, big prints. I would make cinema, but with still camera. So I said, let's pretend that you're a Hollywood producer and you want to make a movie and now the story requires to do a bar. And I needed the object, so I had to run and go from this house and take something, and from this house to take something, and from that house. And it gives me something special every time I go, and I don't look into the garbage, but I look in the garbage of somebody, somebody else. Like, I'm not gonna go to the dump place, I'm gonna go in a warehouse and pick stuff. Most of the stuff, they use it or they keep it or they have a function. And when something has a function, it's completely different. I don't know. It's not a product. It's not a garbage. There, there is some usage. There is, there is something more on it. So I tried, I tried to do my creations, everything. And there are some moments I believe that I'm a scientist, that I'm really smart, and that I have a vision. So I tried to mix my science with my storytelling and with the element of surprise. I picked two or three guys who are walking in the street and they started helping me carrying all these heavy things. And we steal some light bulbs from here. We steal some bikes. We do all the procedures and it's so easy to, to find all these objects in a village which is completely isolated and nothing is happening in the village. There is no, it's not like that. It's not like this building, you know? I can find one million things like that, but I cannot find something new. Everything is in usage in everyday life. So I would do this, I would photograph it, and then the worst part is to destroy it, but without destroying it and give it back to the people. And because I had different ideas and I couldn't stop, I kept, I kept doing the same and the same. At some point I realized that I had something more, sorry, I had something more, uh, ag aggressive, not aggressive, something more revolutionary in me. So this is the very first bomb I put in my pictures. I said, let's make a house, the, f the front door of a house, and let's, let's threaten the, the guy who is inside. And then I kept doing sometimes Sometimes my pictures were funnier, sometimes they were more serious, but sometimes they would be more simple, but I would just had to stick to the plan. I would use everyday objects, I would I would try to suggest that something is really happening. And in this photograph, I was trying to make this guillotine for, for the chickens to cut the head and then to make a chicken soup. That's how I named the picture, chicken soup. So half of it, there are some real saucepans and uh, all these objects that you find in the kitchen. Some of them, they are random objects. And this, this is, was what I was missing. This is the wood that my father puts the chicken and cuts the head. Anyway, I was waiting two days until he would finally cut the chicken. 
and then I would have the necessary details because in the end it's all about details. So once I had some blood, I was satisfied and I would continue. <coughs> and sometimes reality pushes me to do things uh, more spontaneously. I would meet some kids fighting in the streets and I didn't know how to interrupt the fight. I didn't interrupt the fight, I let them fight. But <laughs> the day after, I said, okay, imagine if, if they were fighting in a ring or if I could put the ring in the street or if I, anyway, all these thoughts and <coughs> I just went to my backyard and I did my, my own boxing. And because my village used to be like a lake, which was uh, drowned like many years ago, to, let's say 200 years ago, I, I expected that one day the water will come back and will get, his, will get the revenge. So I tried to, to tell a story about the day that we will have the lake back. And I need, it was like a noise arc. Like, I had to be ready, but of course it's not going to work. So I, did, I used the champagne and all this, and I had the anchor, and I felt it would happen, but it didn't happen. And then as a homage to my father, who was like uh, selling apples in the markets, I realized to be a competitor, but not selling apples to sell some forks and spoons that I found in, the, in our warehouse. And because it used to be like not many telephones in the village, like many years ago, I realized like how lucky we were to have a telephone and to make an extra telephone in the backyard, like a, a phone booth. And then I made my own TV, as I remember. And then I did a conference hall for the important people to sit and discuss the serious things. And finally, uh, when I was talking about my glorious past, I said, okay, I'm gonna make my Parthenon. This is much better than the real Parthenon. And, yeah. And this is a reading stance, like in the Orthodox Church, they, ha they are full of this. Okay. After my, after that project, I, I start doing bombs, but not just like that. It was like 2000, after 2010, that things in Greece got really out of control. And it's okay because in many countries things are all out of control. But in Europe, it's not so, it doesn't happen so often. And imagine your life in Zurich, which is ordinary and normal and perfect. Suddenly everything to come the upside down. So. Greece was uh, a perfect place to live. You didn't have to pay any taxes. You, you could have a perfect life and suddenly this happened. Th this disappeared. So there was like a huge, huge protests, huge, huge riots. People from the next door, they would start making petrol bombs and the kids, in the, the people of my age, they would start making all these tools and uh, weapons to go into demonstrations and use them. Let, let me show you some footage of how it was. It wasn't only the economical uh, situation because sometimes things are more complicated. Greece was completely, there was no private sector. 
everything was public. And suddenly everything was starting to get privatized. This is footage from, uh, from some, it's a village in Athens and near Athens and they start to privatize the garbage. So the villagers start protesting, but look how they protest and this is how it ended. They're villagers, they are, no, they are normal people. <laughs> but look. <laughs> they were opposed to the plans of the government to give the garbage to the rich Greek person who, who would put the garbage next to their village. And you see the landscape with the olive trees and the policemen and the... And suddenly the fights go into the village. At the same time, it's surreal because the guy who's speaking, he says we meet at the liquor store, at the bar, to, to get together and to fight back. It's like we go for drinks and then we fight back. It's so surreal. But this is, this is not something special. All, these things were happening all the time. Okay, so I start to make my own versions of uh, things that they will use against, against the enemy. There was no enemy. I wanted to satirize this thing. It was the time when, you know, you would go to an airport and you would be crazy with security and, and all, this, all these things. And the word bomb was forbidden and suddenly the word bomb was the, I would listen about bombs all the day. Rich kids in the suburbs of Athens were, were considered terrorists because they were the first to, to, to make groups of people who would put bombs into different places. Like there was a new generation of terrorists which were educated in the best universities in Europe. They had a rich background and I don't know why, maybe they were bored, they become the new terrorist generation. So I imagine how they would do their bombs, because I heard all these stories about. So I used everyday objects, like meaningless, and I tried to create a fake threat. I also used my knowledge as a kid that we had this thing that we, we were fascinated by fire and fireworks and small bombs, but only for, edu for not educational reasons, for, for fun. And although things were shit, we kept on hearing about the royal family, like we had enough problems and we need to have a royal family and there were some strange issues with them. And I started researching what was the royal family in Greece and how is it possible a poor country or a small country to have royals. 
and I realized they were not Greeks, they were like sent from Germans, so we couldn't have our own royals. The Germans could send royals for us. Uh, it didn't make sense. Anyway, but the day we kicked them out, they took all the, the fortune, all, all the money, all the gold that they have, and they have a huge collection of Fabergé eggs, like Russian uh, eggs, which were very, very precious. So I start imagining how those Faber's eggs would look. <laughs> they took their yachts, their expensive uh, cars, their expensive furniture, the paintings, and the, the Faber's uh, eggs. They put it into containers, and late at night, they shipped it outside the country. And as life was going on, and I would have a normal coffee with a friend of mine who used to be like the best carpenter in Athens and who would work with uh, the, the best clients, the richest people. Suddenly, he, because of the crisis, he got out of job and his only clients were anarchists who were asking for sticks and bats. He, he was using the wood he, like nobody else. So, they asked him to prepare like 200 bats because they were, they were preparing for a fight in the main square of Athens. So you're driving and somebody asks you for weapons. And I said, okay, this is amazing. You, I tried to do this to give them to the riots, but it didn't work out. So as you see, I'm following what was happening to my country, but at the same time, I'm fed up with the crisis and all this. So I'm, I'm trying to, I know what's happening, but. And then I start thinking of making my own army. Because I've done all the weapons, I've done all the necessary equipment Sometimes I forget that I live in uh, Greece and I, I believe that I live in Afghanistan. And look, look why. This is footage from, uh, from a helicopter fighting the Taliban in the ground. It's like a video game, but uh, the guy believes it. Like, he believes that he's in a war. No, 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 no. Yes, it is. <laughs> I think it's too much. Okay. Lately, I realized that we, we're not different to Taliban in many, in many cases. This is very new. It's a new technique. This is downtown Athens, and this is a police helicopter. And these are riots. There were big, big riots in the, in the streets, 
and suddenly they, they have been so expertized that you can see that they are everywhere around the buildings, that they are fighting the policemen from above. At some point, they are throwing a fridge. <laughs> Imagine in a European capital, these things happening. And also the aesthetic of how the police is tracking down them, it's, it's very similar. They're not killing them, but how things have got out of control. And you see, they're, they're everywhere. And this expertise didn't happen in one month. There are like seven years of uh, all this crisis thing and things get tougher and tougher. The media said that they are trained uh, ninjas, that they are going from uh, one roof to the other. They are doing parkour and all this. At that point, we had the right, right wing uh, government. This is another video from uh, one of the most touristic areas in uh, Greece, where there is the privatized uh, a gold mine, a Canadian company, and but to extract gold, you need to destroy the forest. So one of the best and most touristic and gr green areas in Greece, there are not many, they gave it to a Canadian company and to one of the rich people, Basically, there are five Greek families that they control Greece. So all the, all the commissions, they go to them. And here we have like people protesting. Against the workers of the company, because now we have a left wing government. We have classes like a civil war between the workers that they don't want to lose their work and against the villagers that they want, don't want to lose their life. And again, you see how expert they become into street fights. These are the walkers. And in the middle is the police that they are doing nothing. So I, I was thinking of making my own army like the way I want it. I would make heroes, I would make villains, I would make anything that I want. So I created these fake personalities and would get them ready to go to war. It means troop. Yeah. It's very important to have a narrative and a story, but it's important to, to make it convincing. So you can't just say, okay, this is that. You have to prove it. And you have to be a, pay attention to the details. So I have these obsessions with details. I would, from his head to his 
what he's wearing to his uh, outfit to everything I wanted to be as I wanted like I wanted to be different and I wanted to be special to have a reason to have an expertise I didn't want to be a soldier I wanted to be a specific soldier Sometimes it's completely paradox, playing with something to look funny and not funny, be scary and be sick, or be perversive. And my last project was uh, prison. Okay, this is Greece, okay? This as well. This. And this, so you can go sailing and sunbathing and swimming. And it's amazing. You can have an uh, octopus, uh, and you can do this. They're, they're Swiss. <laughs> yeah. And you can have celebrities taking pictures there, and you can party like with the Italians there, and you can pose like that. The landscape is amazing, but. Sometimes you see boats like this, which doesn't have tourists. And sometimes the boat is not driven by anybody. They stop driving the boat from Libya or from Turkey or anybody, anywhere else. It's in autopilot and, when it, and it crashes in the rocks in the nearest beach. And you have immigrants from Africa which are drowning. This is, this is completely new. It's like two weeks ago it happened. And you see like the, somebody who is trying to rescue, but I don't know what happened. So all these things, they would, they would collect the, all these immigrants and they would take them to they wouldn't give them help, they wouldn't give them asylum because nobody wants to stay in Greece, they just want to be taken somewhere else in Europe. They would put them into prisons. So straight after this disaster, they would lock them down. And I wanted to make something about those people being locked down. European Union would give like a billion to Greece to make some prisons to not prisons like some hospital uh, some hospitality place but instead of that because you live in a third world country and it's so corrupted they would put containers and they would make the life of the immigrants even more unbearable so i tried to make my own prison because the prison that my country had for them was already awful and I tried to design and make ways. This is a rocket. I was thinking how to help them escape from Greece. So I thought I would make a spaceship and I would put them inside and you know, I had all these things. And this would be a fire engine. And, and this is what they, they used to go from one place to another, like the transportation. And I needed a theater for them to enjoy while they stay. And a kitchen. And some lights. So the narrative would process and I would make the guard house and I would try to make an environment which would remind or would bring to mind a prison.
And although this continent knows a lot about uh, prison camps and concentration camps and all these situations, they would, they would make the same mistakes. Yeah, and I got obsessed. Sometimes I would carry it away with the details. Like I would do, I would get my car and my my father's car, and I would put all the stuff inside, and then I would choose a place, and it it get obsessive with repetition and objects, and and then I would start looking how other countries deal with this thing. I, I looked how Stalin deal with uh, the political opponents. So I tried to do a gulag in Greece. This is a place where they can communicate with the others. This is the office of the warden. This is where they can shower. And this is where they can have lemons to produce their own biological uh, fruits. And because I was expecting the worst that it would happen from any day, I did this video. Okay, that's it. to make a third army like uh, we had two parts I want to make my own version um, and this army would have no no reason at all mm. yeah there is never a reason I, I'm not here to give any answers or solutions that's the thing The thing is, yeah, yeah, because I'm using all these materials, which are poor and uh, they are dusty and they are dirty. When I photograph, I, I use the best quality. So I was using a large format camera. I was doing the best prints, the best frames, everything clean. I had to balance this thing. Lately, I photograph with a phase one, which is even more, it has even more quality. 
and my I made my prints even more even my glass like I choose everything to be perfect because if I make it like miserable small prints now I make it huge I make it because that's why I'm doing it you know and I have all these details I want to show the details it's all about the details I'm not hiding I want to show it so I'm making big prints not just to make big prints you know because that's that's the reason I'm doing photography Yeah? Thank you. Okay.